This is the fourth estate on ZTN Prime. We're broadcasting to you from our ZTN studios in Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. I'm Ibn Mabunda. Of course, on the program, we tackle all issues, media as well as journalism. And our subject on this program is the media during and post the elections 2023. Now, to discuss this very subject, we have Perfect Shongwani, Secretary General for the Zimbabwe Union of Journalists. Hello uh, and welcome to the program. Thank you, Ibn. Thank you so much for having us. Fantastic. To get the ball rolling, who um, and uh, what is the Zimbabwe Union of Journalists? What is its mandate um, as well as its role where the Zimbabwean media industry is actually concerned? Oh, thank you so much for that question. Um, so the Zimbabwe Union of Journalists is a, a, a community of uh, individuals that have uh, uh, come together, brought together by one single uh, purpose, which is uh, a, their profession, to make sure that the profession uh, is, is taken forward, to make sure that as a, a profession we coalesce around an interest, we coalesce around what we think should uh, uh, protect us as uh, practitioners in the media. So we are a trade union that represents journalists in the country. And um, uh, in representing journalists, we are talking about representing them in terms of their welfare, representing them in terms of uh, even uh, um, violations uh, when it comes to labor related matters, uh, violations when it comes to uh, how they practice in the field and even in the newsroom. So we are the voice of the journalists in the country, if there are any issues that uh, are affecting our, our members and our practitioners, we are there to make sure that we represent them uh, so that they, they, they find redress. Right. Um, we are, of course, fresh from the 2023 harmonized elections. Indeed. In a nutshell, what is your assessment of the conduct as well as the professionalism of media practitioners in Zimbabwe? I would say that uh, as uh, the media, we did quite well. We are, as a union, very happy that uh, we, we, we covered the elections in uh, uh, manners that uh, we were not expecting. You know, if you look previously at other elections, normally our story has always been told by foreign media or uh, those that are coming from other countries to tell our election story. But this time around, I'll say kudos to the media, especially you guys uh, at ZTN. You know, you, thank, you thank could you. follow uh, what was happening. You're giving statistics. You're giving analysis. You're making sure that your um, consumers or your um, viewers kept on being updated on the issues. And that uh, is uh, what we also saw across the board, even with um, social media platforms. We saw that people were uh, up to pace with what was happening. Uh, in the country regards the election. So I think we did quite well. And uh, uh, our media practitioners and journalists need a pat on the back for that. Right. I'll take you up on the subject of social media a little bit later in this program. Yeah. Now, in the run-up, of course, to the elections, the mainstream media, both uh, public as well as private, signed a media code of conduct mm -hmm. pledge, which, among others, committed itself to upholding professional mm -hmm. as well as ethical standards before, during, and after the elections. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the media or journalists lived up to this particular pledge? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy because uh, as a, a union, we're part of uh, that pledge. We were part of uh, pushing for that pledge to say that as a, a, a sector, we need to, to be professional. So we, it is us who are committed to being professional. And uh, looking at how um, the elections were covered, I think we, we did quite well. Yes, of course, you'll find that there are uh, some issues uh, that happened, especially on, on social media, where people would post things probably that are not factual uh, without verification. But um, um, I think overall, we performed quite well. We committed to the pledge, and we did stand to the, our commitments of that pledge. Right. Now, I want to make reference to uh, one observer mission preliminary report, yeah. uh, which says, and I quote, media watchdogs and candidates noted the spread of disinformation and derogatory and insightful speech in the media, mirroring offline violence and speeches by politicians. Mm -hmm. This did not allow for inclusive debate and ran counter to journalistic ethics and Zimbabwean laws. Yes. In your assessment, did you come across 
such. And uh, what is your comment with regards to this assessment <laughs> by one of the observer missions? You, you see, this is, uh, this is one of the issues uh, uh, prior to the election that we, we were seized with, where we were saying that uh, uh, the media should be professional. That's, uh, that's why we came up with the pledge, number one. Um, and we have actually noticed that it is the politicians, if the media does not guard itself, it is the politicians that then push a narrative, push hate speech, push disinformation, push uh, misinformation. And this comes through uh, some media platforms. But it will be maybe folly for us to paint everyone with the same brush. Yes, like I said, indeed, there are other instances where you found that uh, on social media, people were not quite functional with uh, their stories. Um, but generally and overly, we managed to, to be quite professional and dealt with uh, issues of misinformation. People tried by all means to verify information before pushing it out. Right. Um, now, over the past few years, we have seen the rise of social media usage mm -hmm. in the country. Social media accounts have been at the forefront of breaking unverified news. <laughs> yeah. And this is not only during election time, yeah. but even, even before and even beyond. Yeah. What have been the challenges specific to the rise in social media usage during the elections and uh, beyond? So, obviously, uh, the challenges are the ones that you speak to. The challenges of uh, misinformation, malinformation, disinformation, where you find that every Everyone with a gadget that is able to push information will do so without even verifying. And the, the biggest challenge that we are having is that everyone who does that is now categorized under a journalist or journalism. And that on its own has a serious blow on uh, our sector and our, our industry. We need to ensure that we clean the industry as it were. Yes, there are positives that will come with social media. but. More importantly, in, this age, in, the, in the era of uh, misinformation and disinformation, what is most important is that media houses themselves should be proactive and ensure that they capacitate themselves, they capacitate their uh, personnel, so that we are able to verify, to fact check, and ensure that all the information that we push out is information that is factual, that is uh, verified, that is accurate. Now, back to the same report that I alluded to earlier. Yeah. Um, um, I will quote, media landscape was highly pol polarized along political lines. What do you think are some of the solutions to media polarization in the country? And so far, do you have any complaints lodged against journalists or media with regards to polarization during elections? No, we, we, we have not received any, any complaints with regards to polarization. Um, you see, the, I, I see a danger in uh, generalizing that, to say that there was a polarization on political lines. Um, because in the discourse and discussions that we are having with our, our members uh, who are journalists, who then are deployed to different uh, uh, media houses, who have their own uh, uh, policies, house policies, that is, you, you find that journalists, from where we stand and where we sit, we are not polarized by anyone. We are journalists before we, we are deployed to any media house. Then when I'm deployed to that media house, I write stories according to the house policy. That surely should not be regarded as a polarization on political parties because we, we did not see that happening. Um, some would argue and contend that we now have activists mm -hmm. in a media house who either run the political agenda yeah. of either the ruling party yes. or that run the agenda of the opposition mm. um, in the different categories that you've got there. Yeah. What is your assessment of that assertion? And uh, could we not say that there is empirical evidence? We mentioned social media earlier. Mm -hmm. So um, some contend that when you look at some of the posts that come from um, the different media houses that we've got in the country, yeah. on either side of the political divide, you will see that there seem to be what appear to be strong activists that push the agenda of either the ruling or the opposition. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. It's, it's true that uh, uh, we, we have seen uh, journalists uh, becoming activists. And uh, our call as a union has always been to say, let's uh, desist from doing that as journalists. Remember, 
our role is to ensure that we push factual information, we publish factual information. And the moment that we take lines, the moment that we take signs, we uh, uh, um, affect the credibility of the information that we are uh, given to our consumers. And uh, um, these days, you, you will find that, yes, there are people, journalists who do that. But what is important now is what do we need to do as a profession to ensure that those that violate the ethics, because remember we are a, a, a profession that is guided by ethics, those that violate those ethics are called out. So this is why what we need to, to be seized with at the moment to ensure that everyone who violates those codes, who violates those uh, uh, ethics is uh, called out and uh, we, we, we deal with that. We must have internal mechanisms to deal with those. And this is why we continuously are pushing for the Media Practitioners Bill, uh, which Media Practitioners Bill is meant to then ensure that there is a core regulation framework, which core regulation framework is going to deal with professionalism and ensure that as an industry, as a sector, we are able to, to have a, a peer review mechanism of our own and deal with violations. Would you want to shed more light in terms of the media practitioners bill and what's been the progress in the formulation thereof and perhaps if there are expectations of when we could see uh, that taken up, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, indeed. Um, from the discussions and engagements with the government, um, we agreed that we we're going to, to have that bill. Um, the former minister, uh, Minister Mchangwa, um, was so welcoming to us to ensure that we deal with these issues. The last time that we, we spoke about this, is that the, the principles to the bill were with the um, Attorney General, where they were now looking at crafting uh, the bill. And we, we expected that we were going to have it uh, uh, before the elections. But unfortunately, we, we couldn't. And we think that uh, as we are going into this uh, coming year, we're going to be pushing very hard and serious for that because then it deals with professionalizing the sector. Right. Um, closely related to this is the issue of some journalists who have mm -hmm. been accused of uh, ditching, um, you know, some of the ethics that pertain to journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them have been seen to receive um, perks from some of the politicians <laughs> yeah. and uh, players in business. Mm -hmm. What, of course, would be referred to as brown envelope yeah. journalism. I've also heard that, uh, of course, much as this has been rampant during elections, there are reports, according to some reports. Mm. Um, it has also been uh, pre-existent, the elections. Now, question is, what is your comment on some of these allegations? And have you received any such reports um, to date since the, the election period? Of course, we are now in post-election period. Can you give us your assessment? I'm, I'm that? happy that you, you, you marked <laughs> the, the period. <laughs> And uh, from that period, the answer will be no. We have not uh, received any complaints with regards to anyone who has received any form of assistance to ensure that they write a story in favor of uh, a particular party or an individual. Uh, but this is not to say we are uh, devoid of such. As a sector, we, we have had r reports uh, that uh, people are accepting bribes, people are accepting. Some are even uh, have gone further to, to extort using the profession. And this is one of the things that we condemn to the fullest as a union, because as long as you, you, you involve and indulge yourself in such, then it means that you're not going to be professional enough. You're not going to be credible enough. You become that particular individual's boy, and you'll be uh, doing their uh, bidding. Right, time for us to take a breather. When we come back, we look at several other issues, among them the safety of journalists here in Zimbabwe. For the state, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. up and get ready to fill the rush of everyday break on Morning Rush. 6 a.m. weekdays on ZTN Prime. Get the latest news, what's trending on the streets and on social media. Quick explore of some sporting buzz, weather report, traffic updates, and of course, a hot cup of entertainment.
entertainment, and some fun. Now, that's how you start your day. Each day, every day, with a rush, only on Morning Rush. You are watching The Fourth Estate on ZTN Prime. We're broadcasting to you from our ZTN studios in Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. Now, I am with uh, Perfect Longwani uh, from uh, the Zimbabwe Union of Journalists. Now, let's talk about um, the subject of the safety of journalists mm. as we are fresh from uh, the election, uh, the 2023 harmonized elections. In the previous elections, there were concerns, yeah. innumer innumerable co concerns about how uh, journalists were mistreated, mishandled uh, by perhaps security, even the public in some of the instances, mm. and perhaps they were not allowed in some of the polling centers to have thorough inspection of some of the processes. Um, what has been your assessment where that is concerned during the recently ended elections? We, we are quite happy, even to say that um, we saw a decrease yeah, in terms of uh, violations of journalists. And uh, by violations, as you would know, they come in various forms. Um, but what we saw is that uh, our journalists this time around really um, did not were not violated that much. Yes, we had uh, a few cases, uh, one in Ulawayo, where uh, according to the report that we, get, we, we, we got, um, we had about five journalists who, who, who had um, friction with um, members of a political party. Um, then we had uh, another case here in Arare where a journalist, because they are a freelance journalist, were not allowed into a venue to cover um, a political rally. Uh, th those are some of the cases that we received. But the, the environment itself, this time around, I think was allowing enough uh, for journalists to be able to execute their, their work without any encumbrance. What we uh, did prior to the election was we set out to engage stakeholders, different stakeholders, uh, to ensure that we enhance the security and safety uh, of journalists. One of um, the stakeholders that we engaged was the, the police. Remember, uh, in the previous elections, uh, mostly the police and the journalists were the ones that uh, uh, had serious acrimony um, and were uh, uh, violating journalists mostly. So we engaged the police across the country. We, we spoke to them and we explained to them how we operate as, as the media so that they have an understanding. And we agreed with the police. I will say uh, thank you so much to the ZRP for the, its conduct this time around uh, regards the uh, uh, safety of uh, journalists. They, they, they did quite well. We engaged the political parties as well. And say to political parties, why would you violate journalists? Our role is just to inform the nation of what is happening. And there is no need for you to be doing that. And the three political parties that we engaged as we were going into the election, they all agreed that they were going to ensure that our journalists were going to be safe and uh, protected in their spaces uh, at political rallies. But most importantly, we also pushed for the issuance of uh, press jackets. Uh, reason being, we needed to ensure that journalists are visible enough, you know, uh, because previously some reasons that were being given were to say a journalist was assaulted because we didn't know uh, this person was a journalist. We thought that uh, probably was part of the rowdy crowd uh, and we... They then they exerted what they call minimum, minimum force uh, in a police palace. Now, we issued that, and thanks to the Zimbabwe Media Commission for, for, for doing that. We issued those jackets, and our journalists, I think, would attest to this, that uh, um, there was protection. As long as you were visible, nothing uh, happened. So we, we're quite happy with that. But we're saying uh, the few incidences that we had of the violations of journalists should be, uh, should, we, we must read that of uh, our community. And um, we must continuously engage to ensure that uh, we, we, we keep ourselves uh, are safe. 
Right. Can you speak to the relationship between the media and the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission during this this period? How do you feel about that in the context? Of course, you mentioned the jackets. Yeah. Did they? Uh, what effect did that have in the relationship between the media practitioners as well as the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, in making sure that processes were uh, smooth to put it across that way? Yeah. So, so, so there are quite a number of issues that uh, arise from your question. One of them is um, uh, to say that, uh, obviously, from where we sit as practitioners, we have been uh, lobbying and pushing for uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission to say that it, it should not uh, double our secondary accredit uh, journalists. But this is a function of, of the law. And uh, until such time that the law is amended and dealt with, we still are going to see secondary accreditation. But this is something that we are going to be pushing for to discuss with them and say, uh, why do we need to be uh, accredited again when we have accredited with the ZMC? Their argument is that because you are accredited as observers, not journalists, so that you have access to the polling station. Um, the other thing is also with regards to the money that we're supposed to pay as journalists. So we pay at ZMC, we pay at the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Uh, our members are saying that, uh, no, it's, a, it's a, um, too much. And it's too cumbersome a process anyway for, for them to do that. Uh, I had a discussion just yesterday with um, a, 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 someone from um, the Zimbabwe Media Commission. And we were saying that one of the things that we want to do now is uh, probably speak to Zek to say, let's have that accreditation uh, with a 12-month duration. Right, So you accredit for, for 12 months so that when you have uh, by-elections, you don't have to go again and get accredited, pay again money to get accredited. So it, that way, we, we're trying to have those scores as, as we move on. But uh, in terms of the relationship between ZEC and the media, right. I will tell you that uh, we, we were always complaining to the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission as we were heading towards the, the election that they were not availing themselves. They, they become the, the critical stakeholder uh, in an election environment and period. And they are the information source uh, with regards to elections. So they must be available for the media to be able to talk to them, interrogate their processes, and ask them questions so that the, the, the country and the nation is informed. But that was not the case, and we think and hope that uh, they're going to improve on that. Right. Now, let's talk about media reforms in brief. Yeah. Uh, earlier, we spoke about the media practitioners yeah. uh, bill. bill. Now, we are talking on the Broadcasting Services Amendment Bill. Mm. And the Zimbabwe, of course, uh, uh, you know, government and how it has uh, uh, um, articulated some of the key issues in that particular regard. Do you think that this will go a long way to improve the working conditions and welfare in journalists in Zimbabwe? And what do you think are some of the key elements of that amendment okay so the the broadcasting services act that you are you are speaking about that is uh, being amended um, is going to be dealing with the issue of investment in the sector and for us that's very critical because then it speaks about sustenance it speaks about sustainability so if the media is going to be sustainable it therefore means that uh, even the employees the practitioners themselves are going to be able to be paid salaries that are uh, at least uh, are respectable. Uh, and we are happy with that because now the Zimbabwe uh, uh, Broadcasting, the, the, the Broadcasting Services Act is going to deal or allow investment in the sector. Remember, as we sit, stand and as we sit, that is not the case. No one is allowed to, to invest, especially foreign investment is not allowed uh, to invest in the media. But the amendment is going to be dealing with that. And we think that it's going to speak about uh, uh, sustainability and ensuring the welfare of our journalists. Um, we have the media practitioners bill that I spoke about. That one is basically to professionalize, to ensure that we um, stick to our conduct, we stick to the codes as it were, and uh, uh, so that we call one another out when we violate those codes. Um, so it's basically about professionalizing. Uh, then we, we also have uh, the ZMC uh, Act Amendment. It is going to be dealing with that. One critical issue that we have with the ZMC uh, Act Amendment is that we feel that uh, uh, the repeal of IPA 
uh, was a positive development in the media. And uh, it being replaced by the Freedom of Information Act. But what we see is uh, somehow some uh, clauses that went away with uh, AIPA are slowly being uh, smuggled back into these new pieces of legislation. You speak about the Cyber Security and Data Protection Act. It, it, it now criminalizes the publication of uh, falsehoods, which is what we have been fighting for, in, uh, fighting against when we say let's repeal we don't want you to be criminalized. Let's have internal mechanisms that will deal with your publication of falsehoods. Right. Um, uh, uh, one of the key issues, of course, that would be relevant is that to do with whether journalists are receiving the adequate training oh, yeah. from the different institutions that we have got um, in the country, whether the journalists are being equipped enough to be able to deliver at the end of the day? Do you feel that enough is being done? If not, how can that particular status quo be changed? Yeah, so, so, so that question speaks to the fluidity of our environment, where now you're talking about uh, artificial intelligence. And the journalist that is being chained out from the college, probably they are not even talking about that now, until they do what is called a curriculum review. So we, we, we feel that it is important that our institutions of higher training uh, and tertiary education must uh, keep up the pace with technology to ensure that as a journalist is coming out of their institutions, they are equipped enough. I think they, they are um, okay and they're good in giving uh, fundamental training for, for the journalists, uh, but we need to go a step further and ensure that as a student is coming in into the industry, we are quite um, adequately skilled. But that is not the job of the institutions alone. Media houses themselves, because they are the ones that know the kind of people and skill they want, they must, we must have a backward linkage with the, those training institutions and support their programs to ensure that we have uh, someone who is coming out of that college uh, skilled enough. Lastly, and in brief, um, multiple uh, TV stations were commissioned, as well as community radio stations. Indeed. Well, of course, the sprouting on several online mm. media. What impact do these have on the Zimbabwean media uh, landscape, and what would you want to see with these developments? The impact is that uh, uh, it enhances access to, to information, which is a, a constitutional provision that uh, we must have access to, to information. It is a right that people have that. And it enhances that. When you have multiple uh, uh, platforms from which you get information, uh, there is uh, also issues around choice, where you choose what you want to listen to, you choose what you want to read, you choose what you want to consume. And we are happy with uh, the uh, licensing of those uh, six uh, television stations, and uh, we have seen some have uh, come on uh, online uh, or on air, like yourselves, but we think that we still need to have more, uh, because then uh, the more the merrier, as they say, right. and uh, we are going to be able to see, uh, to, to, to continue to, to engage and lobby that we have more TV and radio stations in the country. Perfect. Shlongwane, the Secretary General for the Zimbabwe Union of Journalists. Sir, thank you for joining us on The Fourth thank Estate. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank well, you. that's a wrap on The Fourth Estate. Do follow us on our social media handles at Zim Papers TV Network as well as at ZTN Prime. Your thoughts and your views are important to us. Well, of course, do catch us with catch up with us um, on our usual programming for the latest from the fourth estate. I'm Ibn Nabunda, the money man. Let them do what they do and we do what we do. We mean business. Thank you for watching and have a good evening.